Welcome to Community Church of Boston. My name is Dean Stevens, and I am called interim administrator, but mostly music director and passionate member of Community Church and uh, student of, of its rich history and of our interesting present and our uh, hopeful future. Um, I am so thrilled about this morning. First of all, because it's the last uh, event before we have a, a pause of about three weeks. With 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 one important um, thing, uh, one important event we're going to do last minute, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But we've had uh, just this string of things. Th Thursday night was we had Max Blumenthal here, and um, uh, it was uh, an address that I think is historic. Also um, called uh, by. Uh, Inez Hedges, a masterpiece of rhetoric, and she has transcribed the whole thing and is looking to put it on other other platforms. Right now, it's on our YouTube channel and has almost 30,000 views. And uh, I just urge you all to, to look at it and um, and see what what he has to say, which is which is just uh, so important in this very tragic moment um, in our history. Um, so thanks for being here. And uh, the, the, after after Max Blumenthal, we had yesterday three events in a row, and it just frazzled me, but, uh, but it was fine. First was uh, a meeting of the Communist Party right here at the church. Um, Kind of remembering that that back in the in the fifties we couldn't say that because we were blacklisted and and paraded before a committee to uh, to interrogate our uh, several of our members. Um, second, we had a memorial for our our uh, departed fellow worker and comrade. Um, Ron Albert, his family was here from a bunch of different places. And um, and third, we had a gala dinner in the evening, uh, which was which was uh, we're still um, spread out and have beautiful table settings and um, and decorations in the middle of each table. I wish you were here to to see it. There aren't many of us here today for an obvious reason, which is that there is an enormous demonstration in the Boston Common today at noon, and I hope. Uh, you all attend if you're not here, and if you're here and need to shear off, that is fine because we are going to raise our voices about the massacre in, in Gaza, and it needs to stop, and it needs to stop now. Um, I think that is all I have to say for this morning's community church announcements. Well, now I will tell you about the 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 exception to the vacation rule, which is something I just booked um, this weekend. Um, Jimmy Tingle is uh, doing rehearsals towards a big event that he has in, in, uh, in one of the theaters at the Boston uh, Center for the Arts. Um, and it's, it's his usual between Christmas and New Year a huge event. He has three nights in in a big theater, and he's just doing rehearsals for it. Uh, he's he's rented uh, our auditorium here for um, for a couple of rehearsals to run through all, all the all the moves and everything. And he's also agreed to be with us next Sunday, uh, December twenty fourth, also known as Christmas Eve Day. And um, I usually do a holiday event when I didn't have one scheduled, but I changed my mind when Jimmy Tingle said, um, come, let's let's do let's do an event together um, on Sunday, December 24th. It will not be televised uh, as per Jimmy's uh, requirements, but we're going to have uh, an event where we hear Jimmy's um, comedy and we hear some holiday music from me and some friends. So join us next uh, next uh, Sunday, December 24th, 11 a.m. right here. Uh, there will be no cameras, just like the revolution. It will not be televised. Um, and uh, I, I hope you can come. I'm really looking forward to it. Jimmy has has become close to our, our, our church. Just recently, he attended an open mic event. Um, uh, what was it like three weeks ago? 
And and he said, I like this. A lot of people come in here and say, I've never been here before. Is this a church? <laughs> that's that's the re, re, is this a church? And the um the, the first one said that it was Miko Peled. He he looked at him and scratched his head. <laughs> Yes, the answer is yes, because it's been called B Community Church of Boston for 104 years, and and it has uh, origins in uh, opposition to the definition of church. Uh, World War One, when a lot of the mainstream Protestant denominations were uh, were uh, recruitment centers, basically for for the war effort, and there was uh, serious opposition to that war and to war profiteering and the support for the conscientious objectors. That's what community church came out of. And it also came out of um, the first struggle that they embarked on, which was defense of Sacco and Vanzetti. Um, so here we are 104 years later, a church, some people say, you shouldn't be a church if you're non-sectarian because church sort of denotes uh, Christian, uh, it's not a synagogue, it's not a mosque, it's not an ashram. Uh, so that's an interesting argument. But um, but here we are, Community Church of Boston, 104 years later. Come and, 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 and join us. Come to one of our open houses when we're not on vacation. We have Wednesday open house. We can show you uh, our archives. We can also show you our enormous um, collection of Sacco and Vanzetti primary source materials that are on our third floor and our library and our auditorium, of course. So um, please be in touch and find out more about us. Uh, I wanna just also take this moment to read um, the list of new members that we have this year. And, and it's a beautiful list. Um, and it starts um, January 8th. Karen Klein, March 18th, Susan Gazal Quiroz, Je May 31st, Jerry Kaplan, who is the volunteer curator of that enormous uh, collection of Sacco and Vanzetti materials that we inherited two years ago. Um, uh, June 4th, Lynn Dan. June 11th, John Harris. June 11th, also Josefina Ruiz. June 28th, Antoine Castro del Rio. July 12th, Stephanie Juliet Cabral. And July 12th, also Dominic Cabral. Um, on uh, October 12th, St. Louis. On October 29th, Rafael Medina. On 11-19, November 19th, Ruth Kaplan. And finally, on 1126, uh, who used to be uh, an active member, his mother was president of, of the congregation about 30 years ago, back with us, David Broig. So it's, it's a really beautiful list, and we welcome all those new members, and we, we urge you to come and find out about us. And if, if you would like, sign this book and be in touch with us. Also, you can be in touch with us from afar. Just join our mailing list and find out what's what's going on. We have um, just a new newsletter out. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, in January, we kick off with a program uh, live from Guatemala, uh, where there's about to be an inauguration uh, with a, a newly elected president and, and an old guard who is trying to do a Trump on Guatemala by, by questioning the validity of an election. Um, so join us. January 7th is the first, first 2024 program. Um, Richard Wolf, we are so happy to have you with us. Um, uh, we have, we have auto designated, uh, Richard Wolf as, as community church's own Taylor Swift. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because Amar Ahmad, who is behind the, the controls, has been doing a great job of putting clips of some of some of our, our best material up on our YouTube channel. One of Richard's has almost a million views. Uh, and that's why uh, I don't know if you like that comparison, uh, Rick, but um, but 
We just we just said it. So there it is. And we'd like to just hand the mic right over to you, Richard. And thank you so much again for for being with us. We just really appreciate that this is your third address with us and we look forward to more. I'm thinking for the 2020s that you are kind of like what Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky was for were for us during the 80s and 90s where they they came to speak once a year. There's the invitation. And thank you again. Folks, let's welcome Professor Richard Wolf. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm a little bit in awe of being linked to Chomsky and Zinn. Uh, they were both heroes of mine, Chomsky still, uh, very much. They're people who uh, I learned from, who taught me. And as a professor all my life, I know firsthand of the enormous impact Chomsky and Zinn and so many others like them have had on the young people that have come in to my classes over the years and been all the better prepared for what I had to offer because of what they had already understood and learned from them. And I appreciate enormously your invitation. I'm honored by it. Uh, because I feel a wonderful association with everything that the Community Church of Boston has tried to be and succeeded at being in that city. Uh, I spent four years of my life going through my college years in and around Boston, so I have a sense of, of that community uh, that has stayed with me all my life, uh, even though at this moment I'm speaking to you from Manhattan in New York City. Okay, my job today, and I want to present it in a context, is to talk to you about the momentous changes going on in the world economy. I am a professional economist by training and by the work I've done all my life. But I had never expected to see in my lifetime the kinds of changes now underway. When they first began to surface a few years ago, I was struck. I hadn't expected to, this process to start. But I'm even more amazed at the fact that it not only started, but that it keeps accelerating the rate of change. And so I want to remind you if some of what I'm about to tell you is distressing or disturbing, as it probably will be, please be aware I am just the messenger. I did not cause any of the things I'm about to describe and analyze uh, for you. And I'm also a student of the great German philosopher Hegel, who taught, among other things, that everything is contradictory and that the good and the bad are very closely intertwined. And I will have things to say to you toward the end of my presentation that will show you where we can go and try to answer in a positive way the question, what is to be done? And a footnote. In 1863, a famous Russian novelist, Nikolai Chernyshevsky, wrote a novel which he entitled, What is to be done? Question mark. It's a brilliant novel whose heroine is a woman, Vera Pavlova, and the book ought to be recognized and by some, I believe it is, as a pioneering work in socialist feminism. The book is built around Pavlova and four dreams that she has. The book was advanced because it was psychologically sophisticated before most people could write self-consciously in that way. With all the changes agitating Russian society 
at that time as it was going through the difficult transition from a thousand years of feudalism to a new capitalist economic system. He wrote about the impact of all of that on a woman, on society, on Russia. And he answered his question by describing a whole new way of living together in couples, in families, singly. There comes the feminism in a socialism that went far beyond the question of the government and analyzed economics on the ground. The book is a long, powerful advocacy for the cooperation of working people in the workplace, for cooperation above competition, for what we would now call worker co-ops instead of the hierarchically organized capitalist system in which employers, a small minority, dominate and control and are unaccountable to a large majority we call employees. A few decades later, the leader of the Russian Revolution in 1902 wrote a pamphlet that was to direct the members of the Socialist Party of Russia in trying to make a revolution. Lenin wrote a famous pamphlet, 1902, which he chose to entitle, What is to be done? Explicitly reworking Chernyshevsky's socialist feminist novel into a political call to action. And in 1923, less than a year before a brain aneurysm ended Lenin's life, he wrote a famous essay on why building worker cooperatives was the most urgent task of the Russian revolutionary government once it had defeated, which it had, the effort of foreign governments and an internal civil war to undo the 1917 revolution, an effort that failed. We're going to come back to all these themes because I'm going to try to end today by offering another explanation in answer to the question, what is to be done? All right, so let me begin by telling you how the global economy has changed. Some of this I hope you already know, but it is my job to pull it all together. The changes are momentous. Why? The two most focal points of the change are about the country we live in, the United States. And they're about the United States because of the central global role this country has played over the last 75 years, or if you like, you can make it 100 years. At least since the Second World War ended, and arguably since the Great Depression began. The role of the United States has been to be the absolutely number one dominant economic system in the world. Nobody came close. World War II eliminated those who might, might have come to be competitors. They never got there, and before they might have, the war eliminated them. What were those countries? Germany, Japan, 
Britain, Russia, period. The war eliminated them. In 1945, the United States was king of the hill. Other than Pearl Harbor, none of that war damaged the United States. On the contrary, the war put the unemployed, the tens of millions of Americans unemployed during the 1930s to work. Half of them were put in the army and the other half were given jobs producing the uniforms, the guns, the ships, and the planes used by the military. The American economy recovered by virtue of war. For the rest of the world, the war added to the destruction that the Great Depression had already wreaked upon them. So the United States was dominant. Nobody was close. So the first thing that has changed is the following. The United States alone and the United States with its major allies is no longer the dominant economic system of the world. This has to be understood, even though the culture and the consciousness of the United States cannot admit it, cannot face it, and is engaged in an exercise of denial that will become the great example of such denial for many years to come. Let me explain. First, the United States inherited over this last 75 to 100 years the colonial position that used to be occupied by Britain, France, Holland, Spain, Russia, Italy, and the other ex-colonial countries. Literally, the British Empire in the 19th century faded out and turned over the role of empire to the Americans who grasped it, who wanted it, and who pushed the British aside in managing to take it all over. And they are still doing that to this day, even with the few scattered remnants of the British Empire that still exist. But now as has happened to every empire in the history of the human race, the rise of the empire is followed by the peaking and the decline of the empire. And we are now well underway on the ride down. What are the signs? Well, I don't have enough time to give you a full catalog, but let me go through a few of them. Recent wars were extensions that failed. The Korean War, at best, a stalemate. The Vietnam War, the U.S. lost. The Afghanistani War, the U.S. lost. The Iraq War, the U.S. lost. The Ukraine War, well, the loss is coming, if it isn't already here, and most of the information that I get, it's already here. That's a big sign. But there's another and easier way to give you the sign of the decline of the empire. And here I will just give you a simple economic statistic. The United States, economically speaking, is the center, the core, the power within an alliance which goes these days by the name G7, the Group of Seven. 
That's the United States plus Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Canada, and Japan. That's the G7. Before the year 2020, the total output of goods and services, a statistics we call GDP, gross domestic product, the gross domestic product of the G7 altogether before 2020 was larger than the GDP of the new emerging dominant economic bloc, and they have a name called BRICS, B-R-I-C-S. The core power there is the People's Republic of China. BRICS stands for China plus its allies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They recently added six more countries and dozens have applied to join them. In 2020, the total output, GDP, of the BRICS, China and its allies, was the same as that of the United States and its allies, the G7. But so rapid has the G7 risen, excuse me, fallen, and the BRICS risen, that by 2023, right now, the share of global output accounted for by the United States and its allies, G7, is about 29% of global production. Whereas the share of total output accounted for by China and its BRICS allies is 20, excuse me, 33%. It's over the dominance, economically speaking, of the United States which was the foundation of the political, cultural, and military dominance is over. And the gap is widening quickly. This year, just to take an unusually a bad example for what I'm trying to tell you, this year, the expected growth of the GDP of the United States will be in the neighborhood of 2.5%. The estimated GDP growth of the People's Republic of China will be 5.5%. You cannot sustain the position of the United States with gaps like that, which have been the norm for 30 years. The global economy is changing. My apologies for the telephone. Okay. Now the second big momentous change. That is the decline of American capitalism internally. Not the empire now, the economic system. Now, of course, the declining empire undermines American capitalism, which, like in every example in history, became dependent on the enormous wealth its empire brought home. A decline in the empire will undermine American capitalism, is already doing that. But I want to show you some of the indices. And that brings me right up against the denial I spoke to you about a moment ago. The president, clearly looking for re-election next year, needs to have his spokespersons telling us all the time how great the economy is. Leading CEOs, commentators, and others, as usual, chime in with whatever the dominant argument is. Even the Republicans, Mr. Trump et al., are hesitant 
to expose the economic system critically for fear of what it might do to their donors. So that leaves it to us. But when you want to assess an economy, it's complicated. It's a little bit like going to a doctor if you're not feeling well. If the doctor only looks at one or two statistics about your body, your best advice would be to go find another doctor. Because, of course, a proper assessment of your health, like a proper assessment of an economy's well-being, requires looking at lots of statistics. If you pick up with my medical metaphor, urine analysis and blood analysis and x-rays and CAT scans and all the apparatus we've become used to. And the medical doctor will expect to find signs that you are in good health intermingled with signs that you aren't. And the job of the doctor is to weigh the complexity. We don't have that. We live in a culture shaped by advertising above all else. And in advertising, you only talk about the good aspects of what you're trying to sell, real or imagined. And you spend a lot of energy hiding or denying whatever contradicts. If Hegel said the good and the bad are always intertwined, advertising is the quintessential anti-Hegelian mechanism. So the government points to low unemployment, correct, and declining rates of inflation, also correct. Two interesting statistics. But to think that the economy is good because those indexes, those indicators are positive would be the equivalent of you're having a serious cancer, but your doctor telling you to go home because your temperature and your platelet count are adequate. So let me just give you an idea of why you might want to rethink the notion that the American economy is anything other than in deep trouble. We are expecting a crash. Some people think it will be difficult. The language for that, a hard landing. Some think it won't be so difficult. That's called a soft landing. We await this because our system is unstable. It has an economic downturn on average every four to seven years. And that has been true for centuries. It's an instability we have tried but failed as a capitalist economy to overcome. There's even an entire economics called Keynesian economics designed to overcome, and it has not worked. For example, in this new century, the 21st century, we've had a crash in 20, in the year 2000, so-called dot-com crash. We've had a crash in 2008 and 9, the so-called subprime mortgage crash. And we've had a crash in 2020 and 2021 called the COVID-19 crash. Three crashes, roughly 20 years, once on average every seven years, right on schedule. This is a very bad quality of this economy, and it has failed to overcome them. Indeed, the last two, 2008 and 2020, were respectively the second and third worst crashes in capitalism's history. Number two, the level of inequality in this country is beyond words. From the $250 billion of Elon Musk to the following statistics, one in six children is what we nowadays call food insecure. We used to be more honest before denial set in and called it what it is, hungry. 
the level of debt incurred by government, corporations, and households is the highest in the history of this country with no end in sight. It, I could go on. We have a record level of homelessness in the United States right now. We have social problems extraordinary, and there are no solutions. And we're experiencing what often happens when an economy experiences the end of its empire, the growing number of problems it cannot solve. We're beginning to see people freak out, look for scapegoats to explain the collapse of everything that seemed to have been secure and now isn't. And so we scapegoat immigrants. Somehow, those poor people trying to cross the border are the root of all evil. In this sad country, we are rediscovering the power of white supremacy to be a haven for people freaked out by what is happening to their jobs, their incomes, those their children can aspire to, and so on. We live in an extraordinary time of change. And I will come back to that. The second big point about all this is that at the same time that all of this is going on, there is now a genuine global capitalism. Here's what I mean, because this notion of capitalism is elusive. The denial enters here too. By capitalism, I mean organizing the production of goods and services so that a small group of people sit at the top called employers and a mass of people sit at the bottom. They're called employees. The employers buy the labor capacity of the employees. The employees come to work nine to five five days a week, more or less, and they do what they are told. Sit there, work with this machine over there in this relationship to other people and to, and then at five o'clock, get up, leave behind whatever you poured your brains and muscles into doing, go home, have pizza, a beer, and come back tomorrow and do all that again. You have no control whatsoever. The people inside that job where you work tell you what to do. They are not accountable to you. We have never had democracy inside the workplace, which is where most adults spend most of their waking hours. We are busy electing mayors of our towns where we reside. But we do not understand what it means that we do not elect the people who run the factories, offices, and stores where we spend our working lives. Why not? If democracy is a great idea, where is it written that it belongs where you sleep, but not where you work? Think about it. The world now, from the United States to the G7, from China to the BRICS, is a world in which production of goods and services is organized in the employer-employee model. The only difference is that the employer can be a private citizen, or it can be a government official. And we are very taken with that debate. I would urge you to open yourself to the thought that that debate is stale, 
minor, and these days, largely irrelevant. For the mass of people, the difference is marginal. Whether the people telling you what to do are state officials or private citizens, what big difference does it make? Okay, now, with a world awash in the employer-employee relationship, and yet at its throat, a conflict between two huge blocks, one declining, the U.S., the G7, one rising, China and the BRICS. What is to be done? Where are we going? What are the implications of this? World leaders, unsurprisingly, are all caught up in the changing world economy. They're all caught up in huge macro level entities, governments, nations, all of that. They're wondering, understandably, what the implications are of a declining American empire. And we're all watching those implications because they are grabbing our attention. Just to give you a few quick examples. The calculation that the United States could wage a proxy war on the border of Russia in Ukraine and provide the relatively small country of Ukraine with weapons on a scale never seen before to fight against a powerful Russia was a calculation undertaken by people who told us back in March and April of last year when that war began that it would cripple Russia, that Russia would soon be on its knees, that the Russian ruble would collapse, and that Ukraine would win. What was the mistake made since none of those predictions has come true and in almost every case, the opposite has happened. What was the mistake? The mistake was to not understand that Russia is part of the BRICS and that the BRICS together can sustain Russia as well or better than the United States and the G7 can sustain Ukraine. There it is. Terrible miscalculation, costing un unspeakable numbers of people, their lives, their futures, their wealth, their hopes, their dreams. Similar mistake is being made by the United States and Israel in Palestine. Different story, different details, but similar mis calculations. And the, the votes in the UN are very indicative. The vote a couple of weeks ago in the General Assembly or last week on the ceasefire in, in Gaza, 153 countries on one side, the side of BRICS, 10 countries on the side of the United States and 20-something abstain. The isolation of Russia has not happened. The isolation of the United States did happen. And it's happening more and more. Here's the problem. And it's, if you like, the moment of the bad news 
before I give you what I believe is good news. The bad news is that the world is on a collision process that we have seen before. We may be watching, living through the decline of the American empire and the rise of the next one. That just as the U.S. empire literally grew out of a very subordinate unit within the British Empire. So the Chinese were a very poor, backward, subordinate part of the world economy in 1949, when the communist revolution in China achieved victory. But they have come an unbelievable distance. They've come as far as the United States came out of its colonial status. The difference is the Chinese did it in one third the time, making it an achievement beyond anything the world has seen. To give you a sense of the scale, every third world country, what we used to call the third world, the developing world, the less developed world, whatever phrase you want, Asia, Africa, Latin America, and so on. Every one of those countries used to have to go to New York or London or Paris uh, to get help to build a railroad, to build a harbor, to uh, invest in schools, to have a decent health program, uh, to be able to find market for its goods. Every one of those countries now has an option it did not have before. It can go to China, and a huge number of them are doing it and have been doing it for a dozen years or more. China's importance in Asia and Africa is off the chart relative to what it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. With these economic connections come political alliances, ideological shifts, and military reorganizations. The United States cannot stop the process any more than the British were able to stop the process. And let's remember, because it's crucial, the British tried. In 1776, they tried to squash the independent development of the North American colony. They lost that war. In 1812, they tried again and they lost again. Only after two defeats militarily did the British give up. They even toyed in the 1860s with siding with the slave South against the North. They didn't do it, but they thought about it. They debated it. There were forces who wanted it. Only in the second half of the 19th and the first half of the 20th did the British collapse. The British Empire was over. Oh, they held on desperately, but it was over. And World War I signaled it. Before World War I, the United States was a debtor nation. Britain was a creditor after the World War I role reverse. Over. So one outcome of what we're watching could be the United States empire finishing its decline, certainly furthering it, and the further rise of China. That's certainly part of what is now going on and there is no end in sight. 
We've had a trade war with China. Remember, that was a signal activity of the Trump administration. We've had a tariff war with China. That was a basic part of the Trump administration. And the Biden administration has continued that. Did it stop the growth of China relative to the United States? A big, fat, resounding no, it didn't, and it's not going to. The effort to destroy the computer chip industry of China is a failure. The company singled out for that purpose, Huawei, just announced it has it its own better chip. The signs are everywhere. So here's the issue. Will the United States repeat the effort of Britain to use military means to hold back? Is that what the noise around Taiwan and the American fleet in the South China Sea, is that what that's about? Are you going to try to do what the British failed to do with us to the Chinese, a country with four times the population and its own nuclear weapons? Really? Well, if so... Well, then, you know, there's not much more to say. Or are you going to recognize what happened between the United States and Britain and sit down with the People's Republic of China or the BRICS and work out a live and let live arrangement in the world economy the way the United States and Britain did in the second half of the 19th and the first half, more or less, of the 20th century. And then we have the fascinating side issue, which deserves much more attention than a denial-obsessed America gives it. Are the Chinese going to be another empire like the U.S. was, like the British were, like the Dutch before them, and so on? Or are the Chinese, with the BRICS alliance, as a hint, going to be a collective, international, empire from the beginning, more interested in inclusion than exclusive dominance. What are the forces that might take them in that direction? And what might the rest of the world do to foster that direction for the story that we are living through? Now, finally, I want to go back to something that unites the world in a positive way, given everything I've said. And that takes me back to Chernyshevsky's novel, to Vera Pavlova's life, to Lenin's pamphlet, and to worker cooperatives. Because one thing that is happening now is something that socialists have been dreaming about for two centuries. The two centuries that there's been socialism. And what they've been dreaming about is captured in the slogan, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. Beyond a slogan, that has not been effective. But now workers around the world have something fundamentally in common, whether they're in the United States or China or Nigeria or Finland or fill in the blank. 
the overwhelming majority are organized into factories, offices, and stores organized undemocratically by a small group of people who make all the basic decisions, what to produce, how to produce, where to produce, and what to do with the output that everybody's labor together generates. All of those key business decisions are made by an unaccountable small minority, the owner of the business, the board of directors, if it's organized as a corporation. Boards of directors usually have 10 or 20 people on them. Employees can number in the hundreds of thousands or even millions now. There is no mechanism through which the employees have a democratic control over the employer. That all these workers have in common. Whether the employer is a private citizen or group or a public official, they have that in common. And I am confident that sooner or later, that commonality will finally become the issue that has to be dealt with. In one way, in the capital, so-called capitalist West. In another way, in the so-called socialist East. Because the fact of the matter is, with all of the changes that distinguish existing socialism from capitalism, those changes do not include a break away from the employer-employee organization of the workplace. Let me conclude then. We have a long history of what Marx called class divided societies. We have the society where a master class controls the class of slaves, master and slave. We have feudalism where a class of lords controls a class of serfs. And we have capitalism, which promised liberty, equality, fraternity, and democracy as part of its revolt against slavery, against feudalism in the French and the American revolutions and so on. But what capitalism promised Liberty, equality, fraternity. What it promised, it could not ever deliver. And the reason is at its core in the production of the goods and services without which no society can survive. It installed and did not question a fundamentally undemocratic arrangement, a class-divided structure. Challenging that, saying that where we want to go is to a society that democratizes the workplace, whether it's public or private, is a call for fundamental change that all workers everywhere can understand and get behind. It would be a way to reorganize the global economy on the basis of cooperation, collaboration, non-hierarchical, 
non-clashing empire frameworks to work out our problems. I think that the 21st century's socialism will be one that foregrounds the transformation of the workplace. Not instead of what socialists did in the 19th and 20th century, not at all, but as the recognition that the socialist movements of the 19th and 20th century did not go far enough. They changed much of the macro part of society, but too little transformation of the micro level, what goes on in the workplace. And lest I be misunderstood, the workplace includes the household, the relationship between the people in a household, in a family, as well as the relationship of people in a workplace situation. The democratization of all of that, the demand for gender equality, for workplace equality, these are the directions in which a socialism of the 21st century will complete the amazing beginning that socialism achieved in the 19th and the 20th century. But in addition, and finally to all of that, we better face these issues of a changing global economy, of a changing American capitalism, because the alternative, and here I borrow from a very important group at the end of World War II. It's this new socialism that I'm talking about, based on a transition of the economy from hierarchical capitalist to egalitarian worker cooperatives. It's either socialism or it will be barbarism of the sort shown to us already in Ukraine, and in Gaza. Let me stop there. Let me thank you again for the opportunity to share with you the work that I do trying to understand what is happening to us. Rise up, you lonely wanderers. Rise up, you hungry people. The hurricane is coming. The land will soon be flooded. The past is dead and over. Rise up and claim your freedom. You are the sleeping giant. Arise, arise, arise. Do not beg for your salvation from preachers, kings, and masters. The people hold the power, arise and claim your freedom. The wealthy enjoy privilege only at your acquiescence. Only while you stay in darkness, arise, arise, arise. divide us they demand their compensation they should pray we don't refuse them arise and claim your freedom though powerful and wealthy they are only human beings on earth we are all equal arise 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 while all of us were sleeping the bank owners got richer at the expense of all our children. 
arise and claim your freedom. They are frightened by our numbers and by our interdependence, and rightfully they should be. Arise, arise, arise. Because in the end, freedom will be international. And do not numb yourself with purchases or vain over consumption. Do not isolate your spirit. Arise and claim your freedom. Your TV and your iPhone seek to keep you in your slumber. Step out into the sunlight. Arise, arise, arise. Rise up, you lonely wanderers. Rise up, you hungry people. The hurricane is coming. The land will soon be flooded. The past is dead and over. Rise up and claim your freedom. You are the sleeping giant. Arise, arise, arise. Thank you, and thank you, Richard Wolf, for joining us today. And we have a little bit of time for a Q&A, but first I want to tell you that we rely on you to keep what we do going, which is create community here in our five-story building in the heart of the city of Boston, a very expensive endeavor to keep it, hey, keep it afloat and keep a roof over our heads and keep the lights on and the staff nourished. Um, you can uh, help us by going to communitychurchofboston.org. There is a PayPal and a credit card function, or there also is a basket on the way out for those of you who are here with us in person. Um, if you would like to join our mailing list, send us an email at Hello? comchurch at gmail.com, uh, comchurch with two M's, gmail.com. And... Um, that's all I have to say, except join us for a non-televised program a week from today. Jimmy Tingle and Dean Stevens uh, share, uh, share the stage while Jimmy Hi, rehearses Jimmy. Can his, I come five minutes programs. later? Um, so we're going to start with the Okay, Q &A. I'll see you um, outside. Amar and I, somebody is... Very unmuted. good. Th thank um, you. Sweetie. Amar and I will, will go back and forth uh, with virtual questions and the questions from, from the floor here in person. Let's start with, with Amar. How about... Great. Thank you, Dean. And uh, thank you so much, Professor Wolf, for that really uh, excellent talk. I look forward to listening to it again. Um, Professor Wolf, my question is, could you elaborate a little more on your analysis of the uh, conflict in Gaza and Israel and its geopolitical and economic implications for the United States? Yes, I'd be glad to. Um, the issue for me, as I think for many people, is a combination of uh, sadness and horror at what happened uh, on the 7th, uh, what set all this off. Um, but that has now been pushed aside, pushed into the background. It's still there. But the horror, the ongoing horror of what is being done uh, to the people and to the cities and territory of Gaza makes it even worse. One understands that Israel had to make some sort of response to what happened, but the kind of it, response they chose is an act of such extreme desperation, such lack of compassion and humanity that it will, I am afraid, in the long run, do much more damage to Israel than to anyone else, even including 
the Palestinians that they are savaging uh, as I speak. And beyond that, I see it in the context of what I tried to explain to you today. The United States is the final authority here. The Israelis cannot and never have been able to act without the explicit or implicit support, financing, and backing of the United States. So what you see, and the same is true in Ukraine, it's not that the local people have no impact. They do. But the impact of the local people is secondary to the power politics of a declining American empire. It has lost its possibilities of allies and friendships in most of the Middle East. I want to remind everyone, if you didn't notice, the new additions to the BRICS a, few, a couple of months ago were places like Iran, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. It doesn't take a genius to understand where those parts of the world are going. It's not to the G7. It's not here. Saudi Arabia is perhaps the most glaring example of a realignment in the world. And the United States continues to use its interactions with Israel as a weapon. This is self-defeating. And the Israelis rely on the United States. That's, a, that's going to be one of history's great examples of betting on the wrong horse in a race. The tragedies are not only for the people of Ukraine, for the soldiers from Russia, for the soldiers from Israel, and above all, for the mass of people, Palestinians, who've taken the worst of all of this. That will be a small part of the story if it isn't understood to be part of this bigger picture that creates an opportunity for the world, yes it does, but also threatens the world with conflagrations for which Gaza and Ukraine are simply early foretellings of what we face. A famous novelist many years ago tried to alert the American people to problems it had by entitling a novel, quote, it can't happen here. Yeah, well, the point of the book was it can. The point of the book was it was already. And all I can do is echo by saying we better watch out because it can, and boy, it will, because the United States remains the center of what is now holding back the kind of change the world is coming to embrace. And that is a very, very dangerous situation. Professor Wolf, I'm now seeing that it's 12.15 and you mentioned that you have a 12.30 interview. So um, I, do. I, think, I think we should do one more question from the floor and let you go with our extreme gratitude for for having joining us uh, joined us this morning. Um, here is here's a question from the floor. Thank you for that global uh, overview of uh, where we stand. Uh, my name is Tim Havel. Uh, I'm an amateur economist by comparison, but nevertheless, uh, the thing which I st was struck that you didn't bring up at all was class mobility, which is arguably the one thing which has allowed the class system to persist as long as it has. And in fact, uh, even going back to the Roman Empire, you can see that when class mobility ended, so did empire. And uh, I think right now what's happened is in the United States, class mobility has become less than it used to be by a great deal. Whereas in China, where a rising tide is lifting all boats, uh, and many perhaps other BRIC countries too, I don't know them as well. Uh, but what I think is going to happen in the decades ahead is that climate change is going to start shrinking the global pie, which we have to eat. And uh, that's going to 
destroy class mobility across all uh, levels of society. Uh, whether that results in a localization of economy and greater democracy or a nuclear war, uh, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> well, first of all, yes, I agree. I believe that uh, class mobility um, can be, and in various uh, periods of time, and particularly here in the United States, uh, it functioned as uh, a support for the system. Uh, you know, as a nation of immigrants, since we ethnically cleansed uh, the people that were found here by the Europeans when they came, uh, as wave after wave of immigrants, uh, a thriving, rising capitalism was able to absorb wave after wave. What we are, in fact, experiencing now, and where I might slightly disagree with you, I think that between climate change and a exhaustion of capitalism, this uh, global mobility, particularly here in the United States, has stopped. And that if you want to understand why Mr. Trump took the slogan, make America great again, well, one explanation is that we've had mobility, it's just in the other direction. And that people who are not able either to have mobility or to reasonably expect it are very bitter and angry that that was taken away, see the decline threatening them all around, and want someone like Trump uh, to save them from it. You are also correct about China. Uh, sometimes uh, when I want to wake up an American audience, uh, I, I say to them that over the last four decades, 40 years, the real wage, average real wage in China quadrupled, whereas the average real wage in the United States went nowhere stagnated, you know, went up at a rate less than one half of 1% per year on average. You could not have a starker difference in the experience of the mass of the working class. So in China, yeah, you can anticipate upward mobility if it is measured uh, by consumption. But if I had time, I would worry you about that measure. Because, yeah, you may have more consumption, but on the job, you are uh, an employee caught in a fundamentally undemocratic system. And if the working class were to finally get the message that its goals not only can be, but should be not just improved wages and working conditions. Because even if you struggle as a worker for better wages and working conditions, and even if you win better wages and working conditions, as long as you are part of an undemocratic structure, those wins are never secure. The employer class can take back what you won from it as long as that class structure survives. During the 1930s and 40s, something called the New Deal Coalition in the United States won incredible gains as the American working class went to the left politically. In the depths of the Depression, when the government had no money, that coalition won social security that had never existed in America before unemployment compensation at the federal level that had never existed in America before, a minimum wage that had never existed in the America before, and a government jobs program employing 15 million unemployed workers, the likes of which we had never seen before, or for that matter, since. But after the war was over, when Roosevelt was dead, the business class of America went to work to undo the New Deal. And they have come a very long way. 
let me remind you, we just went through two terrible experiences of unemployment during which neither the Republican nor the Democratic Party proposed, let alone enacted, a massive program of government jobs, even though we did that in the 30s with great success. Wow. Let me remind you that the last time we raised the minimum wage in America was in the year 2009, when it was raised to the glorious level of $7.25 per hour, which it is today, because neither Republicans nor Democrats saw their way clear to raise the minimum wage any time since 2009. And let me remind you that in every year since 2009, prices of goods and services in America went up, meaning that the poorest of the poor saw their standard of living depressed by more than 20% over these last 12 years. What an amazing achievement of American capitalism. Wow. So I think we have to understand, you have to put this question of the lack of democratic control over the workplace, front and center for the working class, a core of the socialist program, because it's the only way to secure the gains struggle can sometimes win. To the history of the United States, I would say, the Great Depression shows what an organized working class led by the labor movement, and in those days, two socialist and one communist party, what that can achieve is stunning. We've been there, we've done that. But what can be lost afterwards if you don't have democratic control over the workplace, that's equally stunning and offers us an equally important lesson. Anyway, thank you for your understanding. I am happy to tell you that I do have a TV interview because ideas like mine from being on the margins of American culture are now much closer to the center than you might imagine. And it gives people like me opportunities we never thought we would see. And that's also part of the good news. Thank you very much. And I would love to speak to the Community Church of Boston again anytime we can work out the details. Yes. Thank you, Professor Richard Wolf. And um, I hope that one of these days we can receive you in person and host you in the manner in which you are accustomed, maybe, maybe rent a, a, a large uh, hall to, uh, to have a major address, maybe for an anniversary or something like that. But we really appreciate your being with us and your letting us be part of, of your broadcast um, regime, if you will. Um, thank you all of you who joined us on, on Zoom and on YouTube and uh, spread the word about uh, this, uh, this talk, which I just like I repeat what, what I said about Max Blumenthal, just uh, truly important statements about the state of, of the world and the state of the United States. Um, I, I really am in, in deep gratitude, and we, uh, as a congregation, thank you again, Professor Wolf, and, uh, and uh, let you go on to your next broadcast. It's called Democracy at Work is, is Richard's um, uh, site, is that correct? I believe he might have already gone because he, he does have another broadcast, Democracy at Work. Um, so check it out and uh, be in touch with us, comchurch at gmail.com if you would like to be on our mailing list and find out about uh, a whole bunch of magnificent programs that are coming up in the year 2024. Uh, you won't believe what we have for lunch. It is um, what is left over from last night's dinner, and I, I just send my thanks to Sandra Ruiz Harris, our president 
and also uh, Encuentro Cinco, who are now part of Community Church. They have their offices here and they, they do events here. And uh, there is, let me see, there's, there's a wonderful chicken with, with guacamole sauce, poblano style, which means from Puebla, Mexico. There is ceviche. There is a casamiento, which is a, a, a rice and bean dish that our own Luis Guzman prepares. Um, I'm, I hope I'm whetting your appetite uh, for, for what's to come here for you who are here in person. Um, uh, most of you uh, out on the, uh, in the virtual world can't enjoy it because you're far away, but if you're half a block away, like maybe David Lewitt or something, uh, come on by and enjoy the, the, the leftovers of last night's wonderful gala dinner where we raised a, a goodly amount for community church. So that's all we have for you today. We end early and thank you again to Professor Richard Wolf and all of you new faces who, who are here this, this morning and all of you that we're reaching out to on Zoom and YouTube. Be in touch and be connected. Do good work. Go out and, and speak your mind about Gaza massacre. It's, it's a horrific moment and we need to, to let our voices be heard. Thanks again, and we'll see you again next week. No television, but Dean Stevens and Jimmy Tingle will be here uh, for, uh, for a, f 